Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is Run It Back. My name is Remco Rinkema, and I am joined today by Johnny Vibes to watch Season 5 of High Stakes Poker. Two episodes. We're going to do two episodes back-to-back, -back, Season 5. We have a ton of players in the mix, including such names as Tom Vaughn, Ilari, Ilari Sahamis, Mr. Zygmunt. We have Doyle Brunson in the mix. We have Daniel Negrano in the mix. Um, but we, we also have Johnny Vibes in the mix. Of course, you're not on the table, but you are here to break it all down. Um, while I run the intro of the show, um, give me some background on, on your love and, and, and your sort of memories of high stakes poker. Oh, man. Yeah. Growing up in the poker boom era, I was in my early 20s when a lot of this was going down. This is just so nostalgic for me. These guys are icons of the game. And even though I've been in the game for nearly 15 years now, I still get a little fanboy in me if I were to see Tom Dwan or some of these other characters. They, uh, they definitely shaped the poker boom. They also were the celebrities. They were the people that everyone that paved the way everyone in my position even if you've been in the game forever looks up to these guys yeah absolutely these are the legends from the past and some of them are still legends they're still playing every single day and that is the cool thing about high stakes poker you know you can sort of see uh, these guys playing at the high stakes for so many years uh, across you know even multiple decades in some cases uh, in the case of Dola Brunson um, as far as your own personal situation right now um, we, we're living in a strange strange year but please get me caught up to speed on, on how you've been uh, handling all of it all this yeah, man. Um, you know, as a poker player, we always have to adapt and adjust. And it just means that from the United States, I've been playing online and some unregulated stuff. Unfortunately, it, it forces us into the underground, kind of like the Doyle Brunson games where he would go around on his horse and find the games that he could find, you know, find the players that he could beat. So, yeah, I've just been um, I've been playing a little bit online. I've, I think I've played three times since the pandemic started. Um, and when I do play, I try to play the highest stakes that I can find because obviously um, the, the sessions are few and far between. So I want to make them quality sessions, quality games. Yeah, no, absolutely. It is a very strange time. But the good thing is we have so much poker to look back on and break down. Uh, did you have any specific favorite players uh, growing up in the game yourself? <clears throat> yeah, um, I would say that I, I definitely had an online influence. But I, of course, I love the live players. Of course, Tom Dwan, he was kind of, the guy that everybody was like, if I could play like Tom Dwan and win millions, that would be so sick. But the one guy that uh, probably doesn't get mentioned a ton that I, I really looked up to was a guy by the name of Victor Blum. And I think one of the main reasons that I liked him is because he was so different than me. You know, I've always been the older brother, this responsible guy, the guy that can't put a large percentage of my bankroll on the table. So when I saw someone like a Silder, someone like Victor Blum, be able to run up 10 million in bankroll in a couple of days and then be willing to lose 12 million in bankroll in the next two weeks. It was on some level, this guy's psychotic and on some level he was my hero. So you've never had 10 figure swings. Come on. No, no, definitely <laughs> not. I've, I'm married, you know, we're talking about kids. Like I'm, that's one of the things that's actually held me back in poker is my aversion to extreme risk, but it's also helped me sustain a long career in poker as well so it's been a double-edged sword right so as far as your own high stakes poker what are the highest stakes you've ever played and dabbled in yourself yeah the actual the highest stakes that i've ever played was on stream it was on live at the bike and we it was a 25 50 i'm sorry it was a 50 100 game it was a friday game on live at the bike and we were doing straddles for a solid couple of hours so it was uh 50 100 200 and um yeah, that didn't go well. I got stacked. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's too bad. And obviously, you know, we we re we remember the losses much more so than the wins. Um, but sadly, when those losses are then also the biggest games you've ever played in, it's even harder to uh, to for to, sure. Forget. I got stacked against Andy, the silent assassin. So he, I'm sure he's hurt quite a few people in his day. Ay ay ay. We've all been through that before. Uh, for the people in the chat joining us today, we're taking questions. We are live. So if you have any questions for Johnny Vibes or myself about you know anything related to his vlog to his life to his play um to how he came up into the game or about high stakes poker or or whatever else you might be excited about you know i love seeing i love seeing peter eastgate in the game here i haven't seen anything from him in a long time i i really like how he won the main event and decided that he wanted to pursue some other things in his life rather than go down the road of you know being like the ambassador of course we love the ambassador but it's uh, it's kind of nice to see him you know take his life into his own hands and pursue other passions exactly uh eastgate has 
very very interesting facial expressions the the, the frown and the eyebrows uh, a lot of movement in there so please pay attention to that if you're watching this for the very first time he is quite do you the know character. the stakes do you know the stakes that we're playing in this game we're playing a uh, 400 800 with a 100 any um, oh wow <laughs> and um, there may or may not be some straddles uh, the pots get really big of course the on-screen graphics uh, nowadays they show you you know the positions and the stack sizes and all this stuff mm -hmm. back in the day that wasn't really the case but you have the cash on the table which of course is is very intimidating and these guys are not known to back down from each other um, if you're watching the show for the first time please like the video subscribe to the channel all that good stuff both on Facebook and on YouTube I do this show twice a week on Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern and on Thursday at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, so don't miss any of the shows and go back in the archives to watch the other ones as well. Uh, today, High Stakes Poker, Season 5, Episode 1 and 2. We are going back-to-back -back episodes. Um, you know, First and foremost, um, with your current skill level, and I, I like asking this question, with your current skill yeah. level, would you be a favorite in this game? Um, I would say no. And the big reason is, is because most of the guys at this table are absolute beasts, but there's something that doesn't really get talked about um, that really is a huge factor in if you're going to be a favorite in a game uh, or not. And that's risk tolerance and that's your comfortability with the stakes. So even if you have all of the poker knowledge and all of the poker know-how, it's different when you're in the lion's den. It's different when you have the bricks of cash in front of you because now emotion can start to come into play for a lot of people that aren't playing, used to playing with those stakes. So I see it all the time when people shot take to come up to like 10, 20 or 5, 10, they'll bring like one bullet in or maybe two bullets. And just because they know what they're doing and they actually have like a fundamental understanding of the game, I, I see them and I know that they have no shot because they just aren't used to the stakes. They aren't willing to rebuy. They aren't willing to take all the spots. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely much more than just a poker game when you're sitting down with these animals. Um, as far as high stakes poker in the future, because we are bringing it back to Poker Go. Of course, COVID has slowed down things tremendously, but we are planning on taping season eight of high stakes poker. What would it take to get you in the game? How much action would you want to sell? How many bullets do you need? And let's just say that, you know, the stakes will be 400, 800. If the stakes are 400, 800, I think... I would be, I would be willing to put up twenty thousand of my own money, um, and that would be like the upper end of my risk tolerance. Maybe, maybe forty thousand if we got to go with a couple bullets, but that's definitely the high end of my risk tolerance there, and we would need to sell a lot more, and I would just need to really, I. I I don't know if I want to sit down with these animals, though. You got you to gotta send me the lineup in advance. <laughs> <laughs> well, for the Johnny Vibes fans in the chat, uh, do, do let us know if you want to see him in the lineup. You know, we can always, we can always see, you know, GoFundMe is in existence for a reason, and it would always be yeah, cool to have definitely. quite a story to tell. But at the same time, I don't want to sign up to be, you know, be playing with Tom Dwan and, the, you know, these other animals. <laughs> right. Um, even, even animals such as Rick Solomon, Rob Young, Alex Keating, you know, from, from a technical point Point of view they might not be you know the most spectacular gto wizards but the amount of pressure those kind of players put on you because of their you know lack of fear can you explain a little bit about sort of that difference between a tough like tough players can come from different sides yeah so you know right well, i would say when the poker boom really started there was a lot of quote-unquote whales people with a lot of money that would that had a more passive playing style so those were the type of players that, you know, really just the, the good players ate up on. But then you got this new guy who kind of survived through, who was the aggressive maniac, uh, loose player that, you know, maybe wasn't as technically fundamental, but knew how to um, read game flow and also was not scared to put a ton of money in. And those particular whales, those particular guys with money that don't necessarily have the skills, are insanely scary if you don't have the bankroll to play with them it doesn't matter the stake these, when these guys come in and they and you're not comfortable with the amount of money that they're throwing around you're just not going to be able to hang long term exactly that is, that is a very good way to put it um all right 10 on suited that's a nice hand let's listen in and see if this goes anywhere and we definitely have a straddle here because he made it 2500 there we go kings for doyle oh actually no big fine is 800 so this is a normal this is a normal uh, open here yeah, that's yeah. It's a good. It's it's small for this game. We see these guys open to like 4K sometimes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Brunson, this is definitely a, a non-standard play, um, especially 
when there's a ton of money on the table, you're going to want to, you know, reduce the stack to pot ratio with Kings, but he's playing his hand a little tricky here with the flat and in, in later position, which is going to invite uh, Alari Zygmunt in from the, it looks like the small blind, big blind, big blind. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Big blind. Three ways to a flop. That's a flop. That is a nice flop for D-Nags here. I mean, if 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 the past is any indication of the high stakes poker that I've watched, is that you know Negrano is not going to back down at all if Brunson decides to raise here. Yeah, no, for sure. And you know what's interesting about this? I, a lot of times, um, in the new school, you know, GTO school of thought would be to for Negrano to check here, um, but. You know, old school is just like pile money in the pot when we have equity. <laughs> That's very I don't blame him. He, you know, he has two overs and a straight plus draw. So he bets here and he gets raised by Doyle. You know, Doyle, uh, now now considering the way that he's played his hand, he's it's going to be hard for Doyle to fold his hand at, at, at too many points in this hand. Exactly. I mean, of course, you know, there are, there are you know, a very minor amount of combos that have Doyle beat right now. Uh, Daniel decides to call, which is quite passive for, for Daniel, and especially given how these games are usually hyper-aggressive. I mean, they must be very deep, which makes it a lot tougher to get stacks in. Uh, but the seven on the turn, oh, wow, Doyle checks behind. That's, I would not have seen that coming. Yeah, that's uh, Daniel obviously hates that turn card. And now Daniel actually makes a pair of 10s on the river. And he, and he makes it 30,000. You can see Daniel with the talking. I'm not sure what he said. I have nine, 10 of hearts, same thing. Nine, 10 of hearts, same idea. Nine, 10 of hearts? That's impressive. Daniel didn't even think about he calling. Full yeah, he, he had him pegged for having an over pair there. Um, I think he, what he said was make it 30,000 with pocket queens or pocket kings. I think that's what he said, if I remember correctly. Because trust me, I've seen all these episodes <laughs> at one various point or another. It's probably been at least eight years, but... Yeah, in, in this in this case though, I mean, from Doyle's perspective, right? Daniel opens under the gun. If if Doyle three bets, people know Doyle's image is not someone to splash around, so he narrows his range by three betting. So he keeps his range a little wider by um, by flat calling. But still, it seems as though in Doyle's position against the under the gun raiser, there's there's not a lot of easy ways to to make the pot very big. Yeah, I, I think that um, obviously we get to see the cards uh, and a small sizing on the turn. Could, could have worked could have been nice it would have extracted a little bit more value yeah that's true and for certain sizings on the turn i think daniel's going to continue we get another raise with pocket deuces here yeah they see they're bumping it up a little bit now we got three thousand to go exactly and that's one of the things that i loved about these high stakes poker games is uh there was a lot of calling there was a lot of there was a lot of multi-way action and we were seeing some crazy post-flop hands and play yeah and the funny thing is is like sometimes there wasn't enough space on the screen to put all the cards because so many multi-way pots it's really really crazy yeah I, it, on one hand it's like it's kind of funny for me to sit here and analyze their play because these guys are all such high level players but on the other hand it's fun to talk through these hands yeah exactly all right tom Dwan flops a set let's see if he can get some how money do you, how do you that's you know that's why he's tom Dwan. he opens deuces and just flops bottom set Yep. No, no biggie at all there. I mean, Hillary has, I think, uh, Ilari's in a spot here on the button. I think that, um, given that Tom bet into so many players and he only really has one back door here, he can fold, but he didn't come here to fold a pair. Also, I think Negreanu has a continue with backdoor straight draw, backdoor flush draw and a pair. At this point, oh, he raised. Oh, okay. So he raised. <laughs> wow. Maybe he can pick up the pot right here. Look at the facial expression Duan on Duan. I mean, that's very odd mid-hand. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Um, I, I mean, I'm not going to try to read anything into these uh, into these um, live reads in this when you're playing with people like this because Tom's obviously very comfortable uh, playing any stage. So. Right. I wonder, but, um, how, I wonder how many levels deep this goes where Duan realizes that if he sort of makes a face based on previous hands he, he plays against Zygmunt, that you know he's more likely to get some action and, and stuff along those lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Zygmunt uh, thought better of it on the turn there. I, I think that uh, once Tom opened, bet into that many people and called a raise on that dry of a board texture... Uh, Zygmunt's not going to try to barrel him off his hand. I think Zygmunt was turning his three into, you know, blocking middle set um, into into a uh, a bluff raise there, a one-time bluff raise. 
How much would you think? Uh, how much do you think Dwan will be betting here? Just let's take let's take a guess. Um, I think that hmm, I think that he's probably gonna go in the forty five thousand range. And he's All right, reaching let's... for a lot of chips. It looks like wow. The jack and the ten are actually fairly good cards bet. for Tom because, um, Zig, you know, Zig, when you have a queen in your hand, a lot of times it's going to be with a jack and a ten. So Zygmunt could have um, rivered two pair, probably wouldn't check back two pair, but he might. Um, so he, so he's going a little bit bigger, fifty four thousand, because he he's hoping that he turned like a queen jack or a queen ten. Right. For the people in the chat right now, thank you so much for joining us on Facebook and on YouTube. Um, Ron on Facebook says, married with kids. Those are the highest stakes ever. That is great. That is a great line. I love that. Um, shout out as well to Ronald and Jerry um, watching on Facebook. And for people who have any questions, please send them in. Luke is asking, can you get Sammy Farha on the show? Well, uh, Luke, if you get me Sammy Farha's phone number, I'll do my best to get him on the show. Um, also, Jamie Gold is going to be on the show soon. Um, he already promised. We haven't figured it out yet, but he promised to watch the 06 main event final table with me so that's going to be good um Jeanette is asking how many years ago was this game well we're talking season five of high stakes poker so if i were to guess i would say 2009 since peter eastgate is on the table he won the main event in 08 that made him a star so i'm gonna guess 2009 so we're talking 11 years ago think back when you're watching this what were you doing 11 years ago were you playing high stakes poker i should i certainly wasn't i was playing four. No, i was playing one two at planet hollywood 11 years ago i was playing i was playing four dollar 40 180 man sit and goes on poker stars that's what i was doing back yeah, in 2009 sure. um, i think that yeah no so i was still playing online too i was playing um a rush poker on on uh full tilt back then uh, Jamie, uh, Jamie on YouTube is asking uh, Johnny, "Are you back in SD right now? Will you be playing outdoors at Seven Mile? Are you are you are you dabbling in the live streets?" I didn't even realize that Seven Mile was going to do outdoors, but yes, I'm um, I'm in San Diego for the next two and a half months, and then uh, I think I'm going to go abroad, uh, possibly to Mexico, and mix it up on some of the regulated sites a little bit. Nice. Of course, plenty of online action happening right now uh, all over the world. Everybody seems to be just, you know, getting that credit card ready to play as much high stakes online as possible. People flying to Mexico to dabble from the USA. Um, and meanwhile, high stakes poker, we got another multi-way multi -way hand here. Ellie Alezra. Yeah, it looks like air. another open from Alezra. Um, or, I'm sorry, Greenstein opened under the gun. And you can see where the button is. He opened under the gun and there was a a bunch of uh, callers and he still bet ace jack multi-way uh Lazar obviously has a call with a pair of eights there that's a good and looks like he turns a flush draw well barry greenstein hates folding we all know that checks. let's see if ellie makes hmm. a little play here he should nobody checks king on the river that's a really bad card Barry's probably aware that Ellie has a pair huh. of eights, but oh, 25,000 wow. was quick. And Ellie couldn't release his hand quick no, I enough. I like, forgot to check my hand. And I, really I, think, um, I think what happened there is that Barry probably has a reputation for um, being like a value-heavy player. So when he raised under the gun and C-bet into that, that many people and then found a bet on the river, that's not a, generally a very bluff-heavy line. So Eli didn't even think about it. He just like dumped it instantly. <laughs> For the people who are catching this show for the very first time, please know that all seven seasons of High Stakes Poker are now available on Poker Go. All seven seasons. So if you just want to watch this without me and Johnny just talking over this, go to Poker Go right now, watch all seven, seven seasons. And also, we have every single WSOP main event from 2003 up until 2019 available on Poker Go as well. And we are releasing new episodes. I mean, these are classics, of course, from back in the day. But new episodes, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, of the WSOP Classic Prelims event from 2004, five and six so lots of content on poker go for you guys to enjoy um johnny while we watch these hands let's take a moment to sidestep here and talk about how you see the future of your brand of your vlog and and what do you think will happen to you know everything that you've been doing leading up to you know this strange year yeah well i think that uh the one of the things that i love about my vlog is it's just my life so i don't really have to fabricate anything it's just documenting my life along the way so as a poker player obviously it's hard to plan more than a couple months out so i'm kind of always on my toes you know if something comes up we'll talk about it on youtube a little bit if i need to take a break we'll take a couple month break you know during the quarantine i didn't really release videos for three months so 
that's the beautiful thing about making content is that I'm my own boss. You know, nobody's telling me when to make content or how to make content. So if I don't make a poker video for a couple months, it's fine. You know, I, I just want to take things as they come. And it's always been a fun thing for me. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't have too big of plans for it other than to just keep having fun with it and, uh, keep making the content as it, as it feels like it's going to be fun. Right. But do you think you'll stay in, in the poker vlogging space once that's, you know, totally possible again? Can we see you, you know, do road trips again, go to all those local casinos and have meetup games? Yeah, I could see myself definitely still continuing to do that just because I still find it fun. And I honestly think that I'm going to be in poker in some aspect my, my entire life. I might not be, you know, grinding it out every day. You know, I've been doing this, grinding it out for a living for about 13 years now. So the thought of another 13 years is definitely daunting. Um, but at the same time, I'll always be, you know, I'll be firing the main event every year. I'll always have uh, my footprint in poker just because I love the game. And, and um, I, I love connecting with people that watch my content too. So there'll definitely always be some of that. Awesome. Well, that, that is very good to hear. I mean, I can only imagine that many people are now considering maybe, you know, taking a step away from the game because it's been so tough this year to do anything other than playing online, which, you know, it's, it's not everyone's bread and butter. But um, I am curious to hear from from your side of things. Um, people are also asking this in the chat. You know, what was your name on Full Tilt back in the day? Um, what was your relationship with uh, online poker uh, back when that still was possible before Black Friday? And of course, yeah, I want to I, I hear some creative nicknames. Yeah, so um, my nickname on Full Tilt was TMO, the number four, and then SHO, TMO Four Show. There we go. And uh, I I didn't play uh, I didn't play MTTs or anything, so you probably wouldn't see me on like any of the you know pocket fives or anything like that. But um, yeah, I was just I was playing uh, cash games for reps, and the biggest that I played online was uh, 200 and L, and I was playing on Rush Poker. And I had like uh, the highest level of FPPs on um, full tilt, which it wasn't like terribly high. It was like the black card and which allowed me to like get into all the lounges at all like the um, tournament stops and things like that. I won a uh, main event package on full tilt before with, you know, I bought something with FPPs and qualified, um, you know, went to a bunch of the full tilt tournaments, never got the gear, which thankfully I never was like wearing any of the gear. <laughs> Um, but that was, uh, I was, I had a good, a good rake back deal on full tilt. So I was mostly just grinding hands and making like three, $4,000 a month in rake back and just trying to beat, trying to beat for a small, for a small size. So I wasn't making a terrible amount of money, but terribly a lot amount of money. So I was more using it for reps and, and trying different things. Like, what do I do? What does my, what does my database say? It's going to happen when I, you know, flat ace queen versus middle position raise from the small blind. What's it going to, what does it say when I three bet it? Right. You know, what sizings have worked for me? So I used it as like a learning tool so that I could take it over to live poker. Then once Black Friday happened, it was all live poker. We were done with that. Right. All right. Let's watch this hand. This uh, could get interesting. But Tom's got an inside straight draw. We got a four way action to the flop here. Do you know who raised? It was Eastgate who raised. Okay. And Brunson called Don, Tom Dwan, or Greenstein called and Dwan called. Okay. So it's, um, I believe it's cut off button, small line, big blind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if it wasn't televised, I bet you No. Be He's just going to call. No, if it wasn't televised, he'd well, talk more. Right? Really? He is, yeah, how, you know. know. He's <laughs> such an unlucky guy in life. <laughs> Six on the turn. That Ooh, what is a, a savage turn six. card. Bang, K6 on the turn. <laughs> Obviously, both players think that they have the best hand here. I mean, Dwan is thinking like, oh, I call the race pre. You know, this is perfect for me. Uh, Eastgate has, has a lot of big pairs in his range. And Eastgate is thinking like, oh, two, three sixes against Dwan? He's going to barrel off. This is going to be awesome. Yeah. Yeah, he's betting 20 into 27. You see uh, him with his furrowed brow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the 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 animated brow. Mm -hmm. It's actually a um, a really good card in Tom Dwan's mind because now if even if the other guy has a six, like you're you're chopping almost all the time. Peter Eastgate raised before the flop was the original raiser. I've heard that. The only tournament you told me you would play was that seniors event, and then you pulled out of that. I'll never play that. <laughs> it's too slow. 
And Dwan's going to bet $53,900 here. Huh. Again, a big bully. I mean, is it safe to say that it's tough to, to raise here for Eastgate? Yeah, so in general, when you are facing a bet, sizing is going to dictate whether or not you're going to raise. And I think in Eastgate's mind, this sizing could mean that he's possibly beat. So it's hard to raise for value here over the sizing. Uh, and I mean, just like looking at it, it's a ton of money, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Look at his classic. face. <laughs> oh, that's so, that's good. so good. This is the classic Tom Dwan face. This is just, I mean, this is a moment in time. Look at his face. That's so funny. Yeah. I'm sorry. The apparent so nuts shocked. got beat. I don't know if you know, but this is our reigning world champion, Tom. <laughs> you know, I think if he, I think if he goes like a forty thousand sizing, I think um, Eastgate would have raised there. But I think like over fifty thousand, he's like leaning towards calls. Um, it's just, you know, it's easy to see when we see the cards to know that he has like the, the next worst hand. Right. And you, you know, oh, you could have won another 65, you could have won another 70,000, but also when he puts in the raise and gets jammed on you're just like hating life. <laughs> I mean, it is so strange. I mean, Dwan is almost trolling Eastgate because Dwan also has to realize that it is very tough for Eastgate to raise there and get value from anything worse. Um, you know, I'm not a poker expert, you know, and, and you're not on high stakes poker either, but we have, we see the cards and, you know, we can safely assume that this is not an easy spot. Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely, a, a, um, you're not obviously never folding. Um, but you know, obviously Tom's more comfortable with these stakes too, even though Eastgate is coming off the main event. So of course he's going to needle him a little bit here or there. Right. Uh, got some messages in the chat on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, we'll get to some of those questions here. Uh, Wisco Baron is saying, didn't recognize Negreanu without the tank top or with this kind of hair, which is kind of funny. Yeah, he does look... He looks he looks younger now than he did 10 years ago, which is kind of impressive. Um, LG, yeah. LG is asking, what's Dwan up to now? Uh, probably still crushing high stakes all over the world. He's probably, probably dabbling in online. Who knows? Um, but we're very hopeful to have him on Season 8 of High Stakes Poker, so that would be awesome. Um, then... Let's see what we, what we got here. Um, some people referencing what they were doing 11 years ago, which is great to hear that most of these people are already playing poker. Um, uh, someone's asking on YouTube, what was the toughest hand you've ever played? Was it that hand that you got smoked on uh, on Live at the Bike, or was there a different story? Hmm, toughest hand, wow. Um, hmm, I think that... Uh I think one of the toughest, okay, this is one that stands out in my mind. Um, there is a, there's a hand from one of the world series of pokers where I was on the button with pocket Kings and we were probably an hour away from the bubble. And I had uh, a big stack. Like I had, um, you know, tons of big blinds and the small blind was a guy by the name of Scott Palmer. I don't know if you know who that is. You're not a major. He's, uh, yeah, high stakes sicko like someone yeah, yeah. that had played like rail heaven someone that just was not scared and you know cashing the main event is monumental it's something that i'm definitely you know want to have that notch in my belt and it folds to me and we have kings on the button and we raise it up and scott palmer just makes a big raise and, and i'm like well this could be the one um and i know i know he's not scared so i decide to call and and the flop comes uh nine high it's like nine five four and he bets and I call and the, the turn comes like an eight and he bets and I call and then the river comes a three and he bets again and I call and like now once I call I have less than 20 big blinds okay and, and I call and he has nine three off suit for he flopped top pair and he rivered top and bottom oh and my God. I just remember being so crushed and he, I entered the hand scared I entered the hand worried that somebody that had more chips for me than me, who I knew played on rail heaven was capable of busting me in this hand right before the main event bubble. So I played the hand in a, you know, I was on the button. So I got to, I got to call and like play in position, but at the same time, against someone like this, like maybe the better play would have been to just like go to war with him and put in the four bet. So that's probably like one of the most mentally defeating hands that I, I remember playing because he just really got me, you know? Right. So was was that the lead up to a long walk of of I guess, I don't want to say shame but a long walk of despair prior no, to the money I, bubble? I I ended up making the money but because I was short I wasn't able to do much after that so it was kind of like you know I did get the cash but at the same time it was 
you know, if I would have set myself up for a better run, it, it could have gone differently. Right. A uh, come up kid on YouTube is asking, when is the new high stakes poker season supposed to air? Well, you know, there's this little thing called, going on called COVID. So as soon as we can host the game, as soon as we can make it happen, it will happen. And more information on that will be on pokercentral.com and the poker go, um, uh, social channel. So keep an eye on all that stuff. All right. Benjamin flopping a straight Tom Dwan with a flush draw, which might as well be the nuts anyway, because that's how Tom Dwan plays. Let's listen in 8,400 into the pot here on the flop. Jill St. John's brother. I had no idea. You better not come down Texas, kid. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mess me up, huh? <laughs> no heart. You heard a tar. It's funny for Benjamin, too, because he knows he can he can never check against Dwan. He has to do his own betting. Yeah. Um, what, it always seems like Dwan is in position in these massive pots. <laughs> I mean, Benjamin is not complaining. He has he has the he has the straight, the second nuts. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I, I expect a large bet here. Right. And and large bet because of, you know, it being Dwan and because he's out of position, or is that generally a line you would take here? Um, well, large because your hand definitely needs a lot of protection. And if he's calling on a if he's calling on a board like this, he's gonna have some equity against your hand almost all the time. Right. Dwan calls again. Without a heart, I think Dwan might shut down here. Um, but I hope I hope he yeah. gets creative. This is interesting. Uh, obviously, conventional, conventional is to be just just about your hand. Um, but specifically, if you know that Dwan has a five high flush draw and you know he's capable of obviously bluffing scare scary boards, you could check here, but. Ooh, I like this little blocker sizing. Huh. It's almost like a check. <laughs> right. That's funny. It's uh it's like one of those things where like I when he when he includes when he makes it twelve thousand, he could actually have like some two pairs and he doesn't always just have a straight. Right. Um, be like the thinnest of value that he's going for. Uh, Nathan on Facebook is asking, how tough was Eastgate's reputation after winning the main event? Well, what I know, and I'll let you speak in a second, Johnny, that he played a, a online uh, under the name Isser, playing 200, 400, and playing you know high stakes, no limit, and uh, all various sorts of games. Uh, he dabbled in some big PLO also, um, and you know b both before and after his big win. So he was already a high stakes player when he won the main event. Uh, how do you remember that, uh, Johnny? I, yeah, no, I don't have a lot of um, knowledge of Peter Eastgate pre or post main event. So I can't speak on it any, any better than you can. Yeah, so he played for a few more years after winning the main event, had some big runs, made an EPT London final table. And um, I think he got pretty big into sports betting. Uh, I reached out to him recently to do a rewatch of the 08 main event final table. He said, I've talked enough about that final table. I'm not interested, which you know I have to respect, uh, which is too bad because I had so many questions for him. But yeah, he was, definitely, uh, he was definitely someone who was not backing down from anyone during this era. Um, let's see, uh, someone on, uh, YouTube is saying, think poker had the best times between 2005 and 2015. Johnny, your thoughts. Do you think poker is now not as fun as it used to be? Uh, yeah, but I'm definitely biased. You know, when you're coming up in a game and things are fun and things, you know, even when you're, I mean, I was playing small stakes back then and I still look at the times where I, you know, I won $300 at like the, the, you know, the Planet Hollywood poker room. And then I would go upstairs to the club privé and spend 200 of it <laughs> as like some of the most fun times in my life. So of course, yeah, it's nostalgic for me. And poker, just because it's been my profession for a long time now has become more of a business type thing for me. So yeah, it's not as fun. Right. That is kind of weird. But that's right? not to say I don't love it. Right. That's not to say that I still don't love it. Because when you look at numbers of, of these big online events, they're crushing. And, you know, the live events, especially in like the $500 to like 3K range before COVID, were just exploding and were absolutely massive. So in a way, poker is still growing and it's still doing extremely well, especially if you consider that Black Friday really cut down on the U.S. exposure to online poker. So... Um, you know, I don't want I don't want to speculate on things like poker booms because I think they're kind of silly. Good for poker, bad for poker, kind of also a weird discussion. But I would say that COVID aside, poker is pretty healthy now. What do you think? I, I would totally agree with that. I think that a lot of the um, entry, like the, the people entering the game, are more drawn to tournaments now. I think that the tournament scene is growing big time, 
and the cash game scene has been pretty stagnant. Right. But for sure, tournaments, the allure of winning life-changing money over the course of a couple of days, we're, I think that's always going to be healthy, and we're always going to have that. Benjamin and Duan at it again. Check, check on the turn is what I saw, and then we have full house for Benjamin here against Duan with top pair. Of course, one card straight out there. Mm -hmm. I, hope he, I hope he bets 50. It's going to be going to be tough for Duan to call here on a four card straight board. Benjamin bets 27,700. Oh. I'm sure you saw it, Ellie. What, did, don't mess with the Zohan. You saw it? Did you like it? I thought you would like Get something to chase it down with over there. What do you need? A bat or something to eat over there. One of those fruit tarts if it's over there. Okay. I, I thought about you when I saw it. I, I thought about the hummus. The hummus everywhere. <laughs> The hummus gun. Size once. <laughs> size again. The one with Adam. Yeah, so for that particular sizing, he actually has straights too. So that's what makes it harder for Duan is that he would use that sizing with full houses. He would use that sizing with straights. When when you go polar, when you go really big, now he's saying I don't have a straight anymore. I have I have a full house. Right. I, I love the the overbetting, which is more and more prevalent during the. Uh, GTO era as we are now in um, people sometimes say oh GTO makes poker boring or it's not as fun to watch but the actual play is probably crazier because of GTO because it, it, it invites people to overbet and you know do funky stuff like small bets and stuff have you have you studied and, and you know looked into that stuff yeah no I definitely I mean if you're going to continue to play even 510 or higher you definitely need to know theory you definitely need to study theory you need to have looked at simulations you have to understand you know what board textures in certain situations you should be checking with a high percentage or betting with a high percentage so definitely and i think that um pine uh duan was one of the pioneers of overbetting like i know it wasn't through solver work but it was through his sheer recklessness and like knowing spots just like understanding spots so i love to see it Absolutely. All right. Dwan raising to 3,000 with Kings. Standard call there. Elia Lezer with the nine deuce suited. You love to see it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely love to see it. That's what makes season. these episodes so great. Not, am I folded? You think you've played more hands than I have? No, but uh, the one you play. In, in a hand like this, you just want to see two spades and a nine out there just to, just to spice things up. Now, of course, it's going to be an easy one for, uh, for Dwan to take down. Um, mm -hmm. Duan bets Ellie might be thinking about coming over the top. Let's see. Duan bets 7,100. You play those hands, Daniel, or no? Uh, Quan on Facebook is asking, when do you think Vegas or AC will open up their poker rooms? He says, I effing miss playing live. Johnny, what's your thoughts? Because clearly we've seen some rooms reopen already. Yeah, so depending on your risk tolerance, you have pretty much all options on the table in Las Vegas right now. Like if your risk tolerance is really high and you you're okay with like playing with eight other players sitting next to you, just wearing masks, you can go to Caesar's palace and you can play with no dividers, no, ma I'm sorry, mask, eight players at the table. Um, if you're kind of in between, yeah, I think uh, Venetian has options and, and Aria, if you're like less risk tolerant has dividers, partitions, glass in between everyone same with bellagio so you can go at your own pace if you want to play poker head on out to vegas poker is open <laughs> which is kind of nuts but it is it is open it, it is true uh for the people who are wondering what am i watching well this is run it back it is a high stakes poker viewing party with poker vlogger johnny vibes who is joining me today to relive some of these nostalgic poker hands from back in the day featuring Tom Dwan, the legend. Let's see where this hand goes. We have Jack Deuce, which is, of course, one of those classic high-stakes poker hands, a suited whatever whatever this hand is called. Uh, Eastgate raising it up with the ace-king. I, I have a feeling that Negreanu is not going to give up. He limped the button. Yeah, especially closing the action. So he he's on the button there. It looks like there's a button in front of him. Yeah, he limped um, the button with Jack Deuce suited. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely not a... Uh, standard play <laughs> you wouldn't see it terribly often in 2020 east gay raising it up from the small line. and one of the things that i love you know i've seen like these episodes oh my gosh he flops trips 
but one of the things that I love is that I don't remember any of these hands, like the majority of these hands. So it's fun to, to rewatch them, not knowing what's going to happen. Right. I mean, it's seven seasons and 14 episodes per season. So it's over 80 episodes and they're all like, you know, 45 minutes each. So it's hard to remember all these hands, which makes it even more fun to watch them once every 10 years, because then it just feels like a new hand again. All right, we got we got six thousand here from East Cade to ground of calls. Let's see how this develops. Doesn't come to Jack. Full house for Daniel. And he gets oh, wow. his wish. East Cade bets fourteen thousand. Yeah, it's time. And East Cade's doing nothing we'll wrong here. Daniel He's value betting Daniel. his hand. That's going to be good a large percentage of the time. I think Daniel has a call here for this sizing. I, although with two diamonds and two hearts on the board, Daniel could put in a raise, um, thinking that he, whenever you put in a raise, it's because you think that your opponent has like a, a lot of continues. So when there's two hearts and two diamonds, it adds more cards that your opponent can continue with. Great card for Daniel. Yep. I think with specifically with two hearts and two diamonds, Eastgate could go into check call here, but looks like he's, he thinks that Daniel has more value, so he's going to go for, um, he's going to try to get value from like king whatever. Right, right. Or jack whatever of hearts. It's so weird though, because he Daniel Lim calls a pretty big raise before the flop and then just calls down. So Yeah, he could, Daniel could have like jack nine of hearts or, you know, queen jack of hearts, he, which he probably raised the button with those, but right. it's hard to know. Now, obviously, Daniel has a raise on the river, especially 19,000. It's like an easy size to raise over. <laughs> East Kate is already thinking, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> it's tough for East Kate, too, because both the heart draw and the diamond draw bricks off. I mean, you do have the ace of hearts in your hand. And you know that you bet a small sizing on the river, so now you could be psyching yourself out. Right. Like, maybe he's bluff phrasing over my small sizing and now the price isn't so bad you know i only need to call forty thousand to win two hundred thousand it's like not a not a terrible <laughs> price you know yeah that's very true i think if you have the ace of clubs instead of the ace of hearts you could maybe lean towards the call in this situation um but given that you have the ace of hearts and the king of diamonds i mean it's easy for us to sit here and say but i think that um you have to call some of the time here. Do you think that Daniel limping adds a lot of deuces to his range? A hundred percent. I think it's hard to read into like how, what Daniel's button limp range is, um, especially on a televised high stakes poker show. <laughs> um, but I, I, I mean, if he has Jack deuce, we got to give him all the deuces. <laughs> right. It's very true. Very, very true. Look at that facial expression. This is top tier stuff. So Peter looked back at his hand and he World saw that he has the ace of hearts and he's like, well, he doesn't have missed hearts here. Yeah, that, that, that actually makes a difference. He does give up the ace king. Nice fold there by Peter Eastgate. Uh, I think that in, my, in my state of mind, when I get raised there, I usually just get frustrated and just call. I think that a lot of people can, uh, can, can feel that type of emotion when they're playing in live games. Yeah, no, definitely. You don't, you don't want to get bluffed on, on a televised game. Right. That's very true. Uh, for the people who are watching this show, please like the video, subscribe to our channel, both on YouTube and on Facebook. I do this show twice a week. So if you're just tuning in, you can go back and watch the entire show that we are doing today or go back in time to watch my shows with Chris Moneymaker, Greg Raymer, Antonio Esfandiari, Joe Hashem, Dan Coleman. I've had them all on the show during this quarantine period and we are trying to just relive some of these epic moments. And today we're watching season five of High Stakes Poker. All seven seasons are available on Poker Go and season eight, the new season, will be taped as soon as we can and it will be on Poker Go. So got to watch out for that. It's going to be epic. We can't wait to get some of these absolute killers back into the game. And there is Texas Dolly picking up the Kings. Let's see where this goes. Uh not only killers, we are we're actually going to be running a GoFundMe to get me into the game too. <laughs> yeah, so. go, yeah. J Johnny Vibes is going door to door to collect money to be on high stakes poker. It's going to be quite a sight. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, as as you can tell, we the action is picking up with the straddle now and Daniel opening it up with the nine six suited, <laughs> De and Doyle again playing it tricky here with the kings. So far, so good. Doyle has no three bet range, clearly. Well, uh, yeah. So this, since it was a straddle, he just he just overcalled a, uh, a, a raise here. Right. 
Nobody has a jack or five or diamonds. Little bet here would get the pot. All right, comes out with 8,500. Dosa's got you, son. What am I going to do now? Daniel, a little bit ahead of his time with these small sizings with these bets. That's knowing it. that he doesn't need to risk a lot to uh, to take down the pot on this type of board texture. Looks like Doyle is preparing a large raise. Oh, he calls. Oh, so I, I thought he was pushing the brick forward. I was like, what is, what is yeah, happening no, he, here? He lined it up on top of the brick. How bossy is that when you have a brick that you get to organize your bets on? <laughs> oh, man. It's like, you know, we sit on the couch at home having dinner on one of those serving trays. Doyle just has a 50K brick to do his business on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, this is awesome. I don't what what is Ellie thinking here? Is this like he's All right, we're we're going to try to explain this from <laughs> Ellie's perspective. Ellie's thinking I have a 6 in my hand, so the likelihood of something having a 5, I block a lot of the 5s that they would have, the 5 6s. Although, you know, he has the 6 of diamonds, so it's not quite the same. <laughs> um, but yeah, Doyle's not having any of it. <clears throat> right. And I feel as though in these type of games, these guys have played hundreds of hours against each other. I think Ellie is just someone who, you know, when he thinks he smells weakness, he's just going to go for it. And it's like instinct based. It, that's 100%. It's like a small sizing on the flop, a call of a small sizing on the flop. There's a lot of money in the middle, so I don't need to risk a ton to pick up a, a sizable pot. And we're going to go for it. He's, he's recognizing that Doyle could be weak here because of the, the just call pre and the just call of a small bet on the flop. Obviously, he's terribly wrong. Yeah. Doyle checks again on the river. So at this point, he's trying to get him to fold the jack. He's trying to get him to fold ace jack. So if you're going to try to get him to fold that or king jack, you're going to have to go massive here. There's already 190,000 in the pot. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Let's well, so go ahead, do it. I <laughs> dare you. Just do it, son. That face should be on every chip in Vegas. Check. Check. <laughs> oh, man. better of it. <laughs> I mean, it is way harder to check behind than to go all in there, right? Yeah, it's, well, depending on how rich you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a very fair point. <laughs> um, oh. At the same time, if you go all in for 200000 there, Doyle's not loving it. Doyle's not loving pocket kings. So if the stacks were deeper, Ellie would have a better chance in that hand. Yeah, I mean, the more money that Ellie puts in, the more likely Doyle is to fold kings. Right. That would have been quite a hand. That, that, that would have been an all-timer if that were to happen. But in this case, yeah. Ellie does the reasonable thing and checks behind. Uh, Quan is asking on Facebook, um, what, advi what advice would you give someone to become a better poker player? I think this is a question that everyone that loves to play poker walks around with. So from your perspective, Johnny, how, what do you think the approach is? Yeah, so I, I think it changes every year. When I was coming up, the, um, there was no like training sites. There was no solver work. So we kind of had to like find the people that we respected in the game luckily i had my brother who was already playing poker for a living so i got to go to him but nowadays i mean you look like I look at a guy like landon who was just on joey's podcast right and he just he gave you the blueprint that he used over the last two years to cl to climb up to you know, he's being staked but he made a, a rapid ascension from small stakes uh you know micro stakes online to playing in big games the, the path is there if you want it, and you just have to really, really work at it uh, to do it in a short amount of time. I don't think it was really possible to do it in a short amount of time without the training sites and without, well, uh, unless you had someone like really mentoring you along the way back in the day. But now it is possible. Right. And then, you know, what are, what are, what are the study tools you think people should d dive into? Because GTO, is, okay, let me, let me say this. GTO gets thrown around so easily, but there are many other ways to improve your game. Like GTO is something that, sure, you know, it's awesome, it's great, it's very, very, you know, helpful to learn more about it. But it's not mm -hmm. the end-all, be-all for you know a player who plays you know local one-two games or you know mid-stakes and, and low-stakes tournaments. But yeah, it's not gonna it's not gonna help you uh, exploit the the guys that you're playing one-two with max max value. But what it would help you with is like understanding um how to tackle some well-balanced opponents at higher stakes but that's probably not who you're going to be playing right. so i would really i would really just focus on becoming really good at 
ra ranging other ranging your opponents and value betting really well and not calling too much and if you can just like really get the fundamentals of the game down then once you start climbing the stakes of course get things like pio uh, and really study what you're supposed to do in certain heads up situations that'll help you in the higher stakes but one don't don't worry about that stuff right now as you're just getting started worry about beating the guys that you can be exploiting them max playing your hands getting max value when you do have hands exactly i think it's a little overstated that everybody needs to get on the gto train i think for a lot of players even you know i've been around the game forever but i can still learn so much from you know just talking to friends or you know even even reading some of the better books out there still very helpful to learn more about certain concepts and you know even even something as as funny as position and stack sizes, you can you can never learn enough about stuff like that. So plenty. sometimes you forget. Sometimes you sometimes you forget. Like what? I just need to get back to the basics. Here. Right. Like let's just play solid winning poker, and, and sometimes people just get carried away and, and forget you know the the basics. Exactly. Uh, for the people who are still watching and or people who are just tuning in, this is a running back. We're watching High Stakes Poker season five. We are doing this as a live. Live setting, going back um, 11 years back in time, Gabe and AJ on the commentary there on the original show. Um, if you have any questions for Johnny, please send them in on Facebook or YouTube. And don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel. Uh, we've got two shows a week on this channel as far as running back. We have uh, Tuesday, 1 p.m. Eastern, and on Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern. So don't miss out and please dive back into the archives to watch more of this stuff. Um, Johnny, you mentioned earlier that, you know, online poker is sort of the thing now because of COVID, you know, sort of the only thing really to go, to go at, um, you know, do you like, you know, plan sessions? Are you watching the tables to see if the action is juicy? How do you decide when you're going to play and where are you going to play? Oh man, it's, uh, it's, there's definitely no exact science to it. And I have a couple different, um, places that I play. Um, that I don't really want to talk about too much, you know, like we, we have to guard a little bit right. <laughs> nowadays, you know, the games aren't um, as easy as they were back in the day, but uh, I want to get a little bit more into tournaments. Uh, I think that that's where a lot of the entry level recreational money is going. And it's something that I haven't really studied. So I, I dabbled a little bit a, a year ago during the world series playing like more tournaments than I usually do. I usually just play the main event every year. Um, but I think that like going forwards, I want to use online as a tool to study and get better at tournament po poker. Right. I mean, tournament poker is booming. So there's definitely tons of action to uh, to choose from. And uh, right now, even with the WSP action going on on GG, there's there's a lot to pick from as well. Um, all right. We got a straddle to 1600 from Zygmunt. Then we have uh, Eastgate playing a Koi. Uh, calling behind with a Jack-10 suited. We got Benjamin involved. We got, of course, Elezra never folds. Let's see. Let's see where this hand goes. Sahami has just turned over his cards. He's got nine. This is great. To put in the straddle and wake up with a hand like there we go. Nine. The Boom. old 10x. Exactly. <laughs> Eastgate's not folding, right? Come on. Oh, we got it. Yeah, 8x actually. Eastgate's called. Eastgate's called because Jack-10 of Diamonds has potential against any hand. Plus, he thinks maybe uh, Zygmunt's a little full of it here. I mean, I'm just going to call it right now. It's the, the battle of the idiots from Northern Europe. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Shout out to uh, Phil. Yeah, pretty, um, one other player, obviously pretty bad flop here. for Zygmunt. Yeah. He does continue. But this is a, for well, sure like a one-time call for East Gate and evaluate on the turn. Just changed the way he played because he thought he was playing badly. So now he completely he lost four on the turn. Because now he started like and Zygmunt the river said, "Well, maybe he does have an ace." Couldn't win. He lost every day, so it well, maybe he has a flush draw. The fact that East Gate called the I mean, straddle makes Zygmunt more likely to continue, checks. but. He does check behind, which is awesome for for Eastgate. You know, getting. He checks and Peter Eastgate. Remember, he's only got second. Yeah, pair. definitely. Zygmunt raised before the flop. He he, uh, Eastgate over limped. I from what I remember. Yeah, he and, called uh, he, he called the straddle from uh from Zygmunt. So. Yeah, I think that there was a couple of limpers in front of him though, which um, makes it less likely for him to have like big ace type hands. Um, this is uh, this is an interesting bet by Eastgate on the turn here. I I would advocate for a check here, um, just because like Zygmunt still has some aces in his hand, right? That he would uh, that he would check play as a check call on the turn. Um, 
So it's like not not the best hand to value bet with. But uh, he gets a continue from Zygmunt. So Zygmunt thinks that uh, Eastgate is capable of bluffing for sure. I mean, a lot of river cards would have gone check, check there. But now that it's a, a jack, obviously Eastgate is going to come out blasting. Um, mm -hmm. make, making it very tough for, for Zygmunt to, uh, to call once more. And if he does, it's going to get very expensive. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's a really brutal river card for Zygmunt because now if Eastgate, Eastgate does blast, Zygmunt is taking Ace-10 out of his range for blasting off. So now it's like such a more narrowly defined range. Now he's like saying that I that you have a jack. Like in, in his mind, he's like, wow, he has a jack or he has a missed club draw is what he's thinking. Right. Very interesting situation. He can't have three jacks. Look at him soul reading him. <laughs> That's actually really interesting. He, um, Gabe actually mentioned the same thing, that he doesn't think that he would likely be betting an ace here. Right. He's not going to have big aces over limping into the straddle. This is either a jack or, yeah, miss club draw. He does call. Wow. And Zygmunt doesn't act surprised. He's a total professional. Was expecting to see either a bluff or a full house, not that hand. Well, I lost $155,000 in about four minutes. How would you feel? I just got a third mortgage <laughs> on my house. That's all. We spoke to Eastgate and Dwan, the youngest Let's listen to these guys talk. player on the circuit. Yeah, I started playing poker four years ago when I was introduced to the game by some of my friends in high school. And I got kind of fascinated right away with the game. I liked the game. The bluffing elements about the game. It's a very psychological game where you have to uh, use some logical reasoning for what, whatever you're doing. You can still uh, be a good player even though you don't have any in algebra. <laughs> I got started in poker right before college and I just needed a way to make some money and I really enjoyed the game at the time. Pretty quickly with learning a little bit I realized I could make a decent amount of money in it and I needed a source of income so the two fit together and uh, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just, you know, just casual, here I am, you know, high stakes poker. You know, I didn't even... I love, how he, I love how he used the word, I thought I could make a decent amount of money. Well, you were right. He was very right. And he made it seem as though, you know, if you just needed a paper route, you know, he picked poker and now he's on high stakes poker. It's just, it's just so simple. It's just so simple. Um, yeah. We are still playing 400, 800. Eastgate just won a big pot of Zygmunt here in season five of high stakes poker. As I mentioned before, all seven seasons are available on Poker Go. So this is well worth a rewatch as far as the other throwback episodes of this show. It can't be understated that Tom Dwan had a crew. He had a crew of guys that he came up with, uh, Benef David Benefield and, uh, and Phil Galfon, that were like kind of elevating each other by having high level interactions and conversations about the game. You know, he, that's I think and that the point is is that you should really be around people that are passionate about the game that are passionate about climbing the stakes higher because it's going to elevate you right um Michal Datani on Facebook is asking um did Johnny look up to any of these players or learn from them when he was starting his poker journey oh yeah 100 percent. I mean I definitely looked up to Duan Duan was uh kind of the poster child for someone who could go from you know college dropping out of college to playing on high stakes poker you know he's not he's not real estate mogul eli elezra he's not software engineering company barry greenstein he's kid tom dwan throwing in bricks of cash bluffing for five hundred thousand dollars like how can you not look up to that yeah, that's a very, very good point. And Negreanu here with the big raise to 27,600. Dwan does not want to give up his 9-7 suited. Um, and that might lure Eli Lezra and Zygmunt into the pot. So we might be having a big one on our hands here. Eli's got the sixes. He's been losing. I don't see Eli going out here. There's already two players in. It's hard to gauge the stack of Eli, but any any sense here in, in back raising all in if, if his stack size sort of works? Um... It's crazy. Is, is six, is, is, <laughs> I mean, I like crazy, but is six is just too weak of a hand? Oh, here we go. Yeah. It's all in. I mean, I didn't even here remember we go. this. 100,000. Oh, I love this. Kind of like a tournament hand here. Yep. Yeah, he knows that Tom Juan 
doesn't have a big pair. Daniel might, but Ellie's willing to take the chance. He wants to double up. Yeah, essentially what happened is he saw that all that money in the middle. He saw the 27,000 from Negranu and Duan and knew that he could put in 100,000 and potentially win 60,000 yep. without showdown. If he had a big pair like jacks, queens, kings, or aces, he's putting Ellie on pretty much what he has, a middle pair. The question is, does he want to just call and invite Tom Duan to call, or does he want to raise? I don't think Duan will accept the invitation. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing pump fake. Two boards is good. Two boards. Okay. They're going to run it twice. Here we go. You have, a, you have aces? No. You have a pair, right? Pocket pair? Like turn the game. Ace king? Huh? Yeah, ace king? Ace queen of hearts. That's Which pair is yours? That's what I figured. Six of Oh, man. Oh, that's <laughs> such good shit. Everybody's like, oh, man. <laughs> I love Duan's hand here. Duan's yeah, nice. definitely. Such good shit. You have no idea. <laughs> no, you I was a favorite. You think so? Favorite? What you talking <laughs> about? Yeah, he recognizes I was a favorite. <laughs> uh, he lives in a little cabin in Durland. <laughs> where he's the favorite on every hand. I don't know what it was. I think that My they're going to chop it. 50-50 here. It's going to go one board for... One board for Daniel, one board for Eli. Both hands to take the whole pot. First pot looks good for Daniel. Three of clubs on the turn. Still two sixes in there. Ellie needs a six here. There it is. Oh. Oh, oh okay. Okay. <laughs> I love this. I haven't seen I haven't seen this in ten years either, but I <laughs> just call yeah. the cards as I see them. This is amazing. I do remember Daniel being in some very tough spots just from um just remembering a lot of these episodes. Obviously this isn't a tough spot, but Right. So there's some hands that definitely stick out in my mind. Well, the one thing I want to say, and you know, this is maybe a spoiler if you've never seen High Stakes Poker before, and there's the ace for the potential chop, only one six remaining. Um, the funny thing is, is that Daniel was the biggest loser on High Stakes Poker across all seven seasons. And he, of course, made some loose plays and got aggressive in some spots, but he also got terribly unlucky in so many situations. Yeah, I remember that. I, I definitely remember him getting unlucky a lot. Um, he also has a, a club he can hit here. Okay, no club. Oh, wow. <laughs> I was going to quit, AJ. <laughs> Don't leave me now. You'd have been on your own. Chopping it up. Just chopping up, you know, a condominium. Exactly. Um, Noah on YouTube in the chat is referencing that Dwan was only 23 when this was filmed. Holy shit. That's kind of nuts. That's absolutely insane. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the, on some level there is a there's a benefit for being that young and playing for this amount of money because it's almost like you're too young to realize how reckless it is right you now because you've never you don't really have the you're not you don't have the concept of getting beaten down by life and paying mortgages and you know things like that <laughs> so what you're saying is that get all your high stakes gambling in there before you turn 30 because then it's just game over it's the same reason why people say that you should travel while you're young, you right. know? Mm. While you're naive and like willing to experience the world. And and when it's still okay to go broke every now and then? Yeah, exactly. You know, going broke at 23 years old is not the same as going broke at 38. <laughs> yeah, it's very true. Uh, for the people in the chat, please um, let us know where you're watching from. I'm very curious to see if we've got an international crowd here with us today. And also, let us know what your favorite game is. Are you are you a PLO fan? Are you are you into Hold'em? Do you play some stud? Like, let us know in the chat. Um, Johnny, do you dabble? Are you you know in the PLO streets every now and then? I know that you know Joey's doing his very best to make this game as big as possible, but um, you know I'm not sure if you're into that. No, I. Honestly, no. I, I think what, what happened was is I, I went so far down the no limit hold'em route. And then right when I could have like switched over to like tournaments or PLO and started investing time in that, I shifted into creating content. So like that was kind of like my keeping things fresh for me. So I never really you know, to to imagine to try to like study PLO, try to study tournaments, stay up on my game on no limit hold'em and create content, you kinda just have to pick and choose what you want to put your energy in. Right. No, that's a very good point. I mean I'm mediocre at all the games, so you know I don't really have to pick, which is very. It's very... kind of nice that you know the know the games though, like you actually know how to play them. Right. You know, never you never know. You mess around and play a 150 person tournament at the WSOP, and all of a sudden you're 
Only 149 <laughs> people stand between you and a bracelet. I'm probably a favorite over most people to ever win a bracelet because that might actually happen. Because if I play a WSOP event, you better know for sure it's going to be some kind of weird mixed game. Um, that, yeah, that you know how to play and probably a third of the people entering it won't know how to play. They just want to play it for a chance to win a bracelet. Exactly. And and mixed, game is, mixed games, like playing mixed games and calling yourself a mixed game player is the best possible cop out if you suck at no limit. You can say, oh, but I'm a mixed uh, game player. I'm not, I'm not supposed to be good at this anyway. Like I'm just I'm just messing around. So um, if any of you guys watch and need an excuse to be to be bad at Hold'em, just say you're a mixed game player and you'll just you just cover it up that way. Um, we got some viewers. We got San Diego in the house. We got Germany, Finland, Palmville, California, Australia. 4 a.m. and loving it, James. Thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it. We got someone in uh, from Vegas watching. Um, I like SCS. What is that? Is that a short deck or something? Uh, PLO Hold'em, of course. All the games. Who doesn't love to play? a rotation of the games i um, really appreciate you guys all with us here don't forget to like the video and send us in your questions we have we are watching high stakes poker and we've already seen some iconic hands let's just say let's just say that um what else do we have here we got san antonio in the mix we got six plus short deck hold them for murray he, that's his favorite game um have you dabbled in short deck at all uh, johnny i mean that seems to be like super trendy right now yeah, no, I haven't played that game at all. Uh, no, I've, I've seen it pop up in some of the online games that I've, um, that I've, the player pools and stuff. I, I, I've seen it, but have not. I've also seen that they've been doing like things like six card PLO. It's just absolutely wow. mind boggling that you can keep track of that many cards. <laughs> I mean, I've also seen uh, PLO short deck, which was uh, uh, spread in our studio. Uh, I think Ben Lamb uh, was in that game, but like, you know, at one point, we're just playing high card. Like, you know, we're removing so many cards from the deck. It's kind of nuts. Yeah. When when I start playing those games, I just have to flip my cards face up and ask the dealer if I won. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's what most people do when they play Omaha 8 or better. They just not, they're unsure if they got the low or not. Uh, Pitar is watching from Croatia. Really appreciate you with the shout as well. Uh, Tom Dwan and Zygmunt going heads up. This is exactly as if we're watching Real Heaven because those guys use the clash all the time. Just the casual Broadway straight for Dwan against uh, Ilari with top pair, which is a monster. So let's see if this gets out of hand. Zygmunt decides to check too. Very interesting. Seven o'clock. That's actually turn. that's actually a very standard check in this inflated pot. Um, I'm he's you know Ka Kaplan said that it was interesting, but in 2020 that's going to be a check almost all the time. Yeah, because clearly your ace is terrible, so you have short on value, but you don't have a, a monster hand to go nuts with. Yeah, a, a lot of times when you're considering a check, this is kind of a little hack. It's not the be all end all. But when you're considering betting the flop and you're in position, ask yourself if you're going to likely be able to go three streets. And if the answer is no, sometimes you'll you'll check back and go for turn river value. Right. This pot is very it's definitely small. not like it's definitely not the be all end all. It's just kind of like a hack for someone just starting in poker that isn't sure when to check and when to bet. He's got to be convinced that aces are probably the best hand. Yeah, he bet 16,000. So did Dwan check all of the streets? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Now he set himself up for a little check raising on the river here. Check raising used to be the coolest thing. I'm not sure if it's still in style. It was, um, well, you know, it went from not being gentlemanly yeah. to being like all the rage in the late 2000, you know, 2008 to 2015. Um, you know, what was really big for a while was the three betting and the four betting and the five betting and getting it all in preflop. That seems to die down a little bit too. Right. And Zygmunt saying, what's going on here? High stakes poker was fun to watch on TV in Finland, but <laughs> this guy checked three times. Could he have a flush? Could he have flopped a bigger hand than me? I mean, there's so much meta going on between these two guys. Yeah. A lot of stuff going on. Can I sleep tonight? At this point, it's all in their head. It's like, he thinks that I have this. And <laughs> is he just exploiting the fact that he thinks that I have this? And what's my price? Okay, we're looking at, you know, 40, we're looking at 44,000 to win 160, 170,000. So he's like kind of doing the math. Like, is he ever going to have the worst hand here? Oh, he calls. Zygmunt trying to be a sheriff on high stakes poker, catch somebody stealing, but nobody's stealing. <laughs> they wow. all got the goods. In Zygmunt's mind, he thinks that Tom could have a King 10 or King Jack or some sort of king that has no showdown value or some, some sort of king that can't call. 
and right. he's turning that into a bluff. Yeah, and the dynamics between those two guys, they've played heads up and they've played online for so many years. That must be um, a real, it must be really messing with your mind if you do that. Um, a shout out here to uh, Jeffrey from uh, Prescott in Arizona. We got London, UK in the house. We got uh, more England. We got Namibia in the house. Shout out to Windhoek. I think that's the capital. We got Ontario, wow. Canada, Randy. And we got Aziz from Iraq watching. We have a real international crowd today. I really that love it. That is so amazing. I really yeah. appreciate it. We got, oh, we got South Africa in the house as well. So, uh, thanks so much, you guys and girls, for letting us know where you are watching from. We are still watching High Stakes Poker Season 5. These are back-to-back -back episodes. If you want to watch all the episodes, you got to go to Poker Go. We have all seven seasons right in there. And also... You know, let me ask you this also, by the way. Uh, we have all those old prelims from back in the day, 2004, 5, 6, WSOP and stuff. Um, what was your favorite, you know, series to watch? Were you just high stakes poker, poker after dark? Were you more of like, you know, watching the glory, main event stuff? Like, go back to like the early, early days when you discovered the game. Uh, so I preferred to watch the high stakes cash games just because that was kind of what I was working on. I wanted to, I really wanted to see, you know, it was tough with this because we never got to see position and stack sizes and things like that. And once they started to put that stuff on the screen, I was just eating it up. Like, right. you know, the big game poker stars, I would like watch that. Obviously the world series of poker main event episodes are one of a kind iconic. And those are probably the ones that I enjoyed the most, even though I wasn't necessarily a tournament player. It's just the allure of these guys can win life changing money most of them don't have this kind of money so it's going to change their lives and even some of the characters from some of those episodes of uh world series of poker like havad khan oh yeah like that guy was not really anything in poker but those episodes made him an, an icon you know someone that like <laughs> just was transcended of the game bulldozer we all yeah. we all remember that. Sorry for yelling if people are wearing headphones at home. Um, we, ha we have uh, Alaska and Texas in the house as well. I, I knew it could count on you guys uh, over there in those U.S. states. Uh, Jacob says, don't forget to shout out to Denmark. I mean, Peter Eastgate is doing his very best shouting out Denmark, crushing Finland here on High Stakes Poker. Um, it, is, it is definitely the United Nations here on uh, Run It Back. We have India in the house as well. Um, if people have any more questions for us, for uh, Johnny or myself, please send them in right now on Facebook. Facebook or YouTube. We are still uh, diving into these hands. We have a set for Negrano. He's finally made a hand, guys. Round of applause for Daniel Negrano. Let's see if he <laughs> can make a dollar here. It, it's starting out good for him, at least, with Zig, with the Eastgate uh, getting Daniel in the mix. Daniel raises the 55,000. Ay, ay, ay. Yeah, he has, a, um, he has kind of a, a weakish straight draw here and a backdoor flush draw. So Daniel thinks he might make a lot of money in this hand. So what do you, how do you how do you feel about the check raise here? Um, I I like it. I think that um, you know you're he's out of position, so he wants to take the initiative in the pot. And if Eastgate has like a hand that you know contains a six in it, or contains or is an over pair, or is a like an eight nine type hand, he wants to start piling some money in because this is another little hack. Like when you're considering check raising, you just need to ask yourself: Does my opponent? have a lot of hands that he can continue with and if the answer is yes and you have a high value hand go for it start piling money in there there's nothing more fun than that that's definitely mm -hmm. definitely true but it's always scary when you check raise that top set there and the, then the turn comes like the eight and it puts the four card straight on the board right i mean at, le at least you know you're probably not drawing dead so at least you can get it in there um and mm -hmm. but also you like you, you lose a lot of value because people people are going to give up on their on their over pairs just in case because there are some maybe some small cards in your range if you were the one calling the re-raise before the flop um, yeah, definitely. jacob uh, from denmark is asking johnny will you make uh will you embrace the grind tour in europe post COVID? is that a possibility um, it probably won't be an official thing but we definitely have some european plans um some of the things on our bucket list are going to um russia where we want to go to sochi because my wife hasn't seen her dad in over 20 years and he lives in Sochi. Wow. So that's definitely like something that we're going to do. And while we're over there, some other things on the bucket list that we haven't done is like Lake Como in, in the Italian Alps. The real Bellagio. Uh, the real Bellagio. Yeah. Spent so much time at the Bellagio <laughs> in uh, Vegas. Got to see the real thing, you know? So then also I'm assuming uh, combine that with some, with some poker and some vlogs. Uh, yeah, definitely. Because my vlogs are more than just poker hands. They're also a journal for myself, something that I can look back at years later and 
pop on episode whatever and we Olga and I can watch the time that we went to Sochi to meet her dad or the time that we were at the Bellagio at Lake Como um you know we have our we have trips from all over the world on there and so it's it's a fun thing for me as well right would you recommend people to start a vlog or like, poker or not like just for documentation's sake and having you know sort of a reminder of some of the cool stuff you've done uh so it really just depends on what you like if you love travel like there's people that don't even like traveling so if if you don't like traveling and i love it me telling you to go travel isn't really going to make you love it so i actually love the creative process of telling a story and putting a bit video together so when i'm not making money doing it it's i'll still do it because right. it's fun for me so i would never recommend for someone to do something that isn't fun for them already but if they are creatively like liking the process of making a video then i think that you know get over that learning curve of of it being hard also the 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 part about being in front of the camera is definitely something that a lot of people have to get over it's something that i definitely had to get over but if you like making videos make yourself uncomfortable because you're going to have those videos forever right now that's a very good point and i can tell you as someone who's on camera quite a few quite a few hours every week is that it is highly uncomfortable when you first start doing it and listening to your own voice is something that takes a little while to get used to as well um but once you get over those humps it's 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 good to have some mementos of your travels or you know maybe just you know stuff you do around the house it's always good to have some have some footage of the family uh, all right negrano yeah. raising two and a half k Dwan is looking at jack seven of spades beautiful hand especially for someone like tom Dwan. Oh, definitely. It's funny Great growing uh, growing up in poker. You know how we all have our favorite hands. Mine was the Jack Seven suited. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, and those those things are so nonsensical, but we all have stories of that. Totally. I, I've uh, as I've progressed in the game and it's become more of a business like thing for me. I've I've lost the love for Jack Seven suited because I don't play it as much anymore. Man, what a shame. <laughs> when everything's going your way the guy with the Jack's, green goes out jack seven is always going to be ace jack yeah oh yeah for sure it's it's the same way i've never won an all-in with ace rag against king queen it's just not happening okay yeah <laughs> look at his facial expressions he's he's almost going to tell a story and and i don't know get into ellie's head with with this sort of stuff Dwan bets 13, it also it also could be legitimate like, yeah, if I bet here, is he going to call me with a worse hand? Yeah, I think he is. Let's do it. But, but like, wouldn't you wouldn't you want to be more, like, stone-faced and have those thoughts to yourself? Because, you know, I don't know. I'm not a wizard, so I don't know if, if I can pick up anything on Tom Dwan ever. But for, for these players, there must be something in there that they could find. Yeah, I would definitely say yes, unless you have the comfortability with the stakes that Tom Dwan has. Right. If, if like, you are someone that's just, insanely comfortable with throwing in heaps of money in there i'm not going to be as guarded with being casual about things so basically we should look at this as these guys are playing the equivalent of what for us would be like a one two but yeah my point is is that if he's casually tossing in thirteen thousand with second pair here he's probably casually going to be tossing in five hundred thousand with a bluff as well you know he's balanced on his casualness Oh my God, five hundred thousand dollars! When you see it on TV and on high stakes poker, you think, ah, oh, you know, they're just playing poker. But when you think about it in real life terms, you can buy some real good property for that kind of money. Yeah, um, just like the physical act of taking five hundred thousand and sliding it into the middle. I've I've never held that <laughs> amount of money in my hand at one point, you know. Right, that's just totally insane to even think about ever ever that having that happen. And that's the allure of tournaments because if you can find the buy-in, you know, the, the glory and and the money is right there waiting. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we got pocket aces here for Greenstein. Uh, also, uh, notoriously unlucky on high stakes poker. Let's see. I like how we had we had a high level ver uh, view of the table, so we we got to see that Greenstein was under the gun. Oh yeah, because we don't have positions on the screen, so mm -hmm. that's a tough one. There and we go. Everybody is going to call with something semi connected or suited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the uh, the level the, the the entry entry level conditions for a poker hand on high stakes poker were about as low as it gets. Now Brunson here is just like he's just. He's getting infinite to one. They don't have enough space on the screen to do this. So many callers. You know, in normal circumstances, Barry would be like, this is a really good flop. But now he's like, 
anybody could have a deuce at this point. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Man, it's so crazy. Duan's got tens with a queen kicker. I could actually see Duan folding this here because of the number of players He's that Barry bet into. And, and Eastgate has the deuce. Bet. Yeah, it's just a it's a really bad spot for Tom. Juan's going to raise to 37,300. Wow. I don't know what he's doing. He's turning his 10 into a bluff, right? <laughs> that, that, that's all he's doing? Yeah, I think so. I think that um, he recognizes that Barry's range is going to be over pairs, and evidently he thinks with the amount of money in the pot on this dry board texture, he's going to be able to get him to fold that at some point. Right. So if you're Eastgate, are you already nervous and, and not liking this, or are you just hoping that you get all yeah. the money in yeah you're definitely nervous because you know that you're never folding a, a trip deuces to tom and some of the times he's just gonna have you beat. you know seven way action and you have a deuce with a terrible kicker right you know you're never folding but at the same time like you could be beat i mean okay uh, let, let's pause it here for a second because duan is now up against two players that have called his big bet on the on the flop, and of course, uh, Greenstein bet ten thousand. Duan made it thirty seven two hundred, uh, and then Eastgate cold called, and Greenstein called. So, we are seeing the card. So the analysis is very very hindsight. But is it? Correct me if I'm wrong. Is it very obvious to assume here that Greenstein is going to have a lot of over pairs, and Eastgate is going to have a lot of weak deuces, and maybe some tens? I, I think that yes, that's like that's the most uh, that's the most obvious scenario because. Eastgate doesn't have any money invested in the pot and he just casually tosses in, you know, 37,000 out of position in a seven way or I'm sorry, eight way post flop hand. Like he's going to have a deuce here so often, right? There's no, draw, there's no flush draw. There's no straight draw. He has no money invested. It screams deuce. Right. So then Greenstein, Greenstein, it does look like has an over pair as well. So then Duan bets 104,000. The deuces are shrinking even more in your head. Yeah, but I, here's the thing is that he's up against Tom Dwan, someone who has known to be reckless. He, like, this is like what I said before. Like, oh, wow. Oh, it's, <laughs> oh that is disgusting. Dwan could very easily have ace deuce. You know, you know what happened is he, he knew that Tom knew that he had a deuce. Yes. But now so look at, look at, look at his Barry. His face up as a deuce, and he still bet against him over 100,000. So he's like, Hey, Tom knows I have a deuce, and he's still betting over hundred thousand. We gotta let this deuce four go. That's I mean, what went on in his mind. Barry is like in a horrendous situation. It's gonna cost Barry his whole stack also because he's not gonna just call here. He's going all in. You know what they should have done with this hand? They should have not shown Dwan's cards until the end, because for us on the sidelines. It, it makes the hand and discussing it and watching it so much different. Yeah, totally. Wow. 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 <laughs> Barry throws it away. Sure. I had it. Oh my I God, Tom. Show the queen Very already. Come on. Oh, oh. <laughs> he had the best hand. Oh. He, he knows. He knows exactly what he had the best hand. Peter had the best hand. Right, I'll, I'll make a side bet that Peter had the best hand. Well, it certainly wasn't you. I bet he did. Let me look at Peter's eyes. Yeah, he did. I, think Barry, I thought <laughs> Barry had Peter. Okay, I'm taking Barry. Small, Barry's. small, right. but. Yeah, okay, bet you a thousand. Two thousand? One thousand? Two thousand, bet. Oh, now I feel like I have a bad side because you're instant throughout 2000, but we're on. Okay. Yeah. Juan we'll got himself caught in the crossfire there on the flop, but then he just brilliantly played his way out of it with an exceptional move. The only other player I know that would have made a move like that, maybe the late Stu Unger. Incredible move from Tom Juan there to get both players to fold better hands there. And in my opinion, the best hand we've seen today, right? Yeah, it, it's um, it's interesting because of like normally when people get away with stuff like this, it's almost like they didn't know what they were doing. Right. But what happened in this situation is Tom actually knew that Peter had a deuce. 
Yeah. And when you know somebody has a deuce, normally you're going to just check there. Yeah. But he knew that he could get Peter to fold that deuce by putting in a hundred thousand, which is just mind blowing. It's just like takes it to this new level, you know? My God, it's, it's absolutely insane. Um, we've reached the end of the episode. Thank you so much for being with me today, Johnny. I really appreciate it for the people who are enjoying the show. Please, before you leave, don't forget to like this video. I really much appreciate it. I am back on Thursday at 8 PM Eastern time. That's going to be very late in Europe, probably in the morning, somewhere nice in Australia, if you are watching from there. And of course, prime time hour for myself to enjoy a beverage with one of my guests uh, coming up watching probably some poker after dark but we'll see about that um johnny w one final thing what's what's next for you how can people follow you and and what's the latest as far as when new videos are coming out uh so what's next is i'm gonna be in san diego for the next two and a half months and i'm definitely gonna be pumping out some content playing a little bit of live poker but um i think i'm gonna go down to mexico this weekend to take my last shot at the wsop um, online version but if, you, if you've never seen any of my content, the most recent video that I uploaded uh, is kind of a, it documents my last three years on YouTube and um, it kind of summarizes uh, what I've been up to on YouTube. So it, it's kind of a good one to just start with so you can kind of see what I've been up to. And um, yeah, I mean, not here to promote anything, just to watch some poker with you. I love these episodes. Thanks for having me on. And I'll actually be checking you out on one of these future ones. Absolutely. Uh, Johnny Vibes, go check him out on all the social platforms. Once again, thank you all so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it. We'll be back on Thursday night, 8 p.m. Eastern. For Johnny Vibes, my name is Rem Karinkama, and I'll catch you guys on Thursday.